where I want to start is with the Agile Hardware Developer course, which is the evolution of what Peter helped set up for me in Zurich originally, and then that went global. Step five of the Agile Hardware Development course is what happens to funding, budgeting, if speed of innovation is the primary value. In the Musk companies, pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run. Elon says this continuously, stresses this point. Most companies use something called waterfall in hardware. And the definition I'm going to apply here might be a little controversial, but I think you'll agree it provides an interesting lens, an interesting angle to look at pace of innovation. And that's the budget length. I will define waterfall as yeah, a series of sequential phases that intends to have a single release, but more primarily with a one year or longer budget cycle. And what a product owner does that's genius is takes that annual budget and makes an agreement with the company to fund 30 day or one calendar month or less cycles. And that's what Scrum calls a sprint. The goal, and a lot of companies fight back against this because it's hard initially for a waterfall company. The goal of a product owner is to make a list of 12 or more separate deliveries for the calendar year, and that's called a product backlog, and then change them as soon as you deliver the first one into the market. So they all change. None of that budget is locked. If all 12 of those don't change, you're doing waterfall anyway. You're doing incremental waterfall, not agility. So the goal of a product owner is to introduce a shorter budget cycle where truly we don't know what we're spending the next budget increment on until the current budget increment is spent. Now, not everyone would agree with this definition of a product owner. I find it useful in this lens. And here's why. General Motors recently announced a 400 million US dollar new Canadian battery, battery materials plants for their Ultium platform. And I replied to that news event saying waterfall companies like General Motors primarily, they have agile inside in pieces, but the primary leadership of General Motors is well on this budget cadence. Waterfall companies announce funding releases years in advance. This locks up funding, requiring delegation and politicking over months to adapt to financial commitments to changing environments like the ongoing chip shortage. This is what creates office politics, coping with, at one level, coping with these long running budget cycles. The same thing happened to Porsche, part of Volkswagen Group. Porsche taken production temporarily halted over Ukraine crisis. Not everybody knows it's public. Volkswagen has a nine year budget. And I replied to this news item, the war in Ukraine was not predicted in the nine year budget for the Volkswagen Group. Last, Honda and Sony agree to electric vehicle development partnership, first deliveries in 2025. What the leadership group in Honda and Sony did is they committed a very large amount of money and then mandated a date to the engineers. This creates maximum stress for the engineers. They have this waterfall promise, whether it's engineering responsible or not, to deliver, to, to and th this is where nights and weekends, and in, in these Japanese companies, this is where the concept of death by overwork comes from. I don't mean to make it too dark, but that is it. It's a commitment years in advance, the budget is now locked, and you're told to deliver X by Y date, which is another definition of waterfall. So you have your waterfall, all the features, plan, analyze, build, test, deploy, as opposed to what a product owner does, splitting into month long or less, 30 day or less, releases that are each individually budgeted. And as soon as one releases, each of these has to deploy. As soon as one deploys after testing in a month or less, then we decide, what to do next. We change the subsequent items or reorder them, which in effect re-budgets. This is how a product owner introduces agility 
to a company with year or longer budget cycles. And this is true in hardware or software, financial services or medical devices, et cetera. The Musk companies take this to a very interesting extreme. In the Musk companies, pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run. And what happens is the product owner function becomes real-time funding. And I'll leave the rest of the speed of innovation section for another day. And I'll move us actually to the step we would cover before, step four, the justice board. The justice board is what the product owner function has become in the Musk companies. It's real-time financial awareness. For Tesla and SpaceX and OpenAI and the boring company and Neuralink, you have a real-time metric that every employee can see on their phone and on monitors all around the company that says how much money is in the bank account, real-time. Right now, how much money is in the, in this case, Tesla bank account and how fast is money being spent? That's called the burn rate. This is not new. Silicon Valley companies have been doing this for more than a decade, in some cases, much longer than that. This is new in mains, in large volume production, a million units a year automotive. This is new in rocketry. Uh, this is new in implantable medical devices like Neuralink. So where it's being deployed is new, but the concept of real-time finances is not new. This is also called venture accounting. In all the Musk companies, the question is not, are you hitting the budget? There is no budget. Instead, the question is, are we spending enough? The reason this is responsible is we have a metric that's visible real time, value divided by capital expenses plus operational expenses. What composes the justice board then? are rows of experiments to improve the operational efficiency of each company. So in the case of Tesla, one experiment to improve the value delivered, that's towards the company mission, which is advancing sustainable transportation. The advent of sustainable energy across the world is Tesla's mission. That's value divided by burn rate, how quickly money is being spent. One of the experiences improving the paint quality on the Tesla Model 3. It is already by objective and subjective measure, it's best in the world. Um, I, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of that. Subjective and objective measures, the Tesla Model 3 paint quality is the highest of cars in production in the world. Uh, there have been several people who have been found to have sabotaged the paint on a Tesla, like painted rust on aluminum, which doesn't rust that way, doesn't rust to brown, um, and tweeted it, Facebooked it, created a lawsuit, they have been caught and sent to jail. But it doesn't mean the news didn't go out there. So some people still have a misconception that there's paint quality issues, far from it. Still, the best can always get better. So one of the initiatives is paint quality. Step one for someone in a funding position, which is actually everyone, and this is what a product owner has become in the Musk companies, step one is what is the measure of capital efficiency, of financial efficiency? For Tesla Model 3 paint, it's deliveries to customers divided by CapEx plus OpEx. If a customer ever declines an order, that is the worst case scenario. They say, I have a paint defect to the point where I won't accept my car. I'm gonna send it back. That would be the worst thing that can happen uh, from a paint perspective. Then you have automated measures by machine learning from multiple angles of the car, how many photons of light in what spectrum are refracted back per given amount of light in. This is called luster, it's called luminescence. Um, the, by the angle, the, the angle of which the light is changing, how much the photons coming back change gives you increased depth. This is all measured by artificial intelligence. It's all measured by actually very standard off the shelf cameras all around the cars as they go through what's called the inspection line where I worked many times. I published a, a separate YouTube video on my YouTube channel on the digital self-management in the inspection lines because there's finally a picture of that in the wild. As a product owner, what that has become, they actually don't use the title product owner in the Musk companies anymore, but what a product owner has become as a funding person 
is can you measure it with artificial intelligence? Can you make an improvement to it? Can anyone make an improvement to it today? And does that map to increasing the value of the mission of the company at the same or better financial efficiency than, than the company is currently operating? Other examples of that are ramping up pre-orders for the Cybertruck and the rate and quality and pre-production of the Cybertruck where it is now. That's happening in Giga, Texas, where I just returned from. Uh, then we have the Model Y in production. Can its range be consistently increased? And it is every day. It's not always updated by the, the sticker, but every day you wait to buy a Model Y, it gets a little more efficient. Same for all Tesla products. Um, then you have software packages also at this level, like Autopilot. Now, Autopilot's original measures for the people making financial decisions, which is what product owners have become, and they are now everyone, it's everyone in the company. Originally, it was, can the car observe the world around it at all? This was called Auto labor, Labeler. Can it detect a lane marker? Can it detect a cone or a safety barrier? Can it detect a pedestrian or a pet or a wall? at all how many things can be labeled then it's how many kilometers of road in the world can the car perform at human level safety or better then the metric changed again once that became millions and millions of kilometers of road and it's percent safer than human so now the governing metric is a ramp up of how much safer is a kilometer driven in autopilot than a kilometer driven by a human. And that's measured by rates of accidents per kilometer. And now it's trending to, depending on which kilometer, uh, it, where in the world, which road, um, near 32X. Each of these initiatives has different trends. And the trend is all about how it affects the financial efficiency of the company towards its mission. Uh, so that was autopilot as an example. Another is butyl tape as sound deadening and environmental sealing in different aspects of the car. Can we deploy that robotically? The factory is the primary product. So these also have rows on the justices board, things like Gigafactory. And its values are measured in terms at the top level, cubic meter divided by CapEx plus OpEx. Uh, that's during build. Then it's production rate inside that cubic meter, production rate per cubic meter. Uh, and then CapEx and OpEx to continue operation in the Gigot factory, the financial efficiency of the operations and the volumetric efficiency of the factory operations. Some of these have to-do lists, which is a lot like a Kanban board or an Agile board or a Scrum board. Some of them don't, some of them it doesn't apply, uh, but many of them do. Now let's get to SpaceX, the, this presentation's topic. SpaceX governing metric, uh, again, is bank account balance divided by how much the, the rate of money being spent. And the question there is, are we spending enough? It's always a push. Can we spend money faster efficiently? That is the constant push for everyone. Then the supporting question, are we spending efficiently? Spend should always be increased up to 100% of revenue as long as the efficiency level is the same or greater than yesterday, the day before, the running average. And again, that's value divide, uh, divided by capital expenditure plus operational expenditure. Value for SpaceX is actually even easier to measure than Tesla. It's cost per kilogram into low Earth orbit. That is it. There's no budget plan for this. It's simply, if anyone has an idea, that will increase the number of kilograms we can get into orbit per yen, Swiss franc, euro, US dollar, Dogecoin, do it immediately. You have permission, you don't have to ask for permission, do it immediately, mistakes are forgiven, go for it, do it now. And that has produced the lowest cost per kilogram into low earth orbit in the history of space flight by an order of magnitude. Not everyone knows, how ridiculously more financially efficient SpaceX is than everyone else. You can see the plot here, cost per kilogram into orbit, SpaceX Starship. 
Uh, this graph's actually old. It, it's actually almost an order of magnitude lower than that. Um, it is the, the current trend. What that also means is you never exit production. A lot of aerospace companies treat their product as a one-time use delivery mechanism for a particular customer payload. That does prevent external iterations. Internally, they could make prototypes and they do, um, but those all decrease their, um, uh, th their available budget for profit. What SpaceX does is SpaceX funds the Falcon 9 rocket system. And what you see in my Zoom background, uh, this is a picture I took last week, so this is fresh, um, of the Starship. Here's three sprints of Starship. These, these take about one month apiece now. These are the largest rockets in human history. And this is the booster. And I'll talk more about that shortly. SpaceX produces these in, in volume production. Falcon 9s are about one a week. Starships are about one a month. And that's regardless of customer contract. And what SpaceX does is none of these are made the same. These are all independent. Uh, sorry, these, these are all innovations. None of these are identical. They never have been. The engines inside are each unique. The Raptor engines are each unique. So what SpaceX does is financially different from a product owner function perspective. Instead of I have a contract to put a payload into orbit, I will now build a launch system to take it to orbit as a one-time system. And that is how these projects are financed in the United Launch Alliance and others. Instead, SpaceX says, we're gonna be building starships as fast as we possibly can anyway. Do you wanna pay for a ride on a starship? So SpaceX doesn't wait for customer contracts to build the next starship. They're building them anyway. And then they sell ride space on the system they're already building. This is a fundamentally different financial model. What, what I will call in the agile context, product ownership in aerospace. And that has driven down the cost per space flight because the number of iterations, it is truly that the rate of innovation is, and the mathematical formula, according to Elon Musk is, and I completely agree, how short are your iterations and how much innovation is there per iteration? That is the math. So you want to build new rockets faster and have there be even more innovation per rocket. That is it, that is the math for pace of innovation. And SpaceX as a result is the most financially efficient cost per kilogram into orbit company ever in the history of aerospace. Then what are supporting theories towards that? Things like thrust per CapEx OpEx for, for the rocket engines and the Rap Raptor series of engine now goes from design to built, test fired, installed on a rocket every two days, two day sprints in hardware. Um, you can visually see the simplification happening, the refactoring happening in hardware. Hardware agility is actually easier than software agility because you can see it. You don't have to go to UML to visualize the interfaces. You can actually see the connection points and the cooling wires, the electrical wires, the control wires, the cooling tubes, and their simplification. You can see the bell diameter changes. You can measure the alloy differences. And there's actually tags that show you the specific alloys for all these parts. Uh, Raptor's moving to V4. Now, Peter Stevens helped me define and actually helped me name Justice's Law which all the Musk companies do use, you take your products and derive the structure of the company from that. Now, Peter and I earlier recorded just this part as a bonus feature. So if you watch that preview video, this part you've heard, many of you might not have heard it. I wanna say it here now. This is the fundamental structure of a Musk company that enables the speed of innovation. The Starship, is this huge rocket here. And you can see three of them in this picture I took last week. They're built about one a month and they're all different. Starship is its own company inside SpaceX, wholly owned by SpaceX. And it's their job to build Starships as fast as they possibly can. Now they need suppliers to do that. 
the suppliers, most of them are wholly owned by SpaceX in order to go fast enough. So one supplier is these barrel sections. You can actually see them in stainless steel here. And these are all different. They're all different specific alloys. They have different embedded electronics, thermal measures, cooling pass-throughs, avionics mounts. They're all different. They're all experiment, experiments to be better, but they're completely interchangeable. They can go anywhere in the rocket or in the booster. So the Starship consumes those like a commodity. And as long as the interface is the same, as they continue to innovate, get thinner, lighter, faster, cheaper, have more avionics capability, they're integrated and into the booster. The booster program also takes those as a supply. Now, inside these rockets, there's tanks. A rocket, in many senses, is a very complicated balloon, um, series of balloons. Now, back to the, to the Miro. Here is a tank header, one of these balloon headers. That's a separate company, like a supplier, inside SpaceX, wholly owned by SpaceX. They make tank headers. They don't make any two the same. They're all experiments to be better, faster, cheaper, lighter, superior embedded electronics, superior safety measures, superior performance, higher pressure, uh, better use of off-gassing and exhaust as a recirculating, a recirculative forcing function, et cetera, et cetera. Now these tank headers change constantly and there's multiple use per Starship. Booster also uses the same tank headers. Now these are all different, but as long as the interface stays the same to the barrel sections, they can be mixed and matched. The rockets simply increase capability, reduce in lightness. Um, the overall length of these rockets is dynamic. It does continue to change as the booster, uh, as the tank inside dimensions change. The known stable interface between the booster program and the Starship program are the launch pads. The launch pads have a stable interface to bolt onto the booster and the Starship. And because that's the same launch pad, that is your integration test to verify, verify the Starship will successfully mate to the booster. So these stack, it becomes super tall, uh, uh, much, much taller than the Statue of Liberty in the United States, New York City, Ellis Island. The launch pad team is actually incredibly complicated and I'm not sure how many people would appreciate it. These things are so big, so massive that when a Starship or a booster is bolted to them stationary, it's essentially floating in the earth because it's so heavy. It's anchored into the earth like a ship, like a seagoing ship. And that has to stabilize under wind loads while the rocket is firing and then unlatch in time to allow the liftoff of that for the booster or Starship, because these are actually set, tested independently. Most rocket systems are, set, are tested. Um, uh, you have a final integration test as your gating function. In SpaceX, that's not needed because the Starship can fly on its own. The booster can fly on its own. In fact, both have. Um, and the, the launch pad is the known stable interface between those two. And the top of the booster is essentially the same mating surface as the launch pad above its grid, grid fins, which also serve as the catch tower. The structure of SpaceX is these modules. So you don't have a head of cost reduction. You don't have a head of procurement. That would only be slow because everyone would be in a queue against those functions. What product ownership in SpaceX has evolved into is building starships as fast as you possibly can and making sure each one has a higher financial efficiency than the previous, a lower cost per kilogram into orbit than the previous. And as a result, you're on Sprint 25. No other aerospace company does this with anything near this big. Uh, and that's why you have the garden in Boca Chica of all of these previous sprints. Someone asked me years ago with Peter Stevens, what's the biggest problem in agile hardware? And I, I said it at the time, something I, surprised me building cars with agile back in 2006 with Wikispeed is how much space it takes up. And 
no one seemed to appreciate this. This is actually the problem. You need a huge amount of space. If you're building a new version of a rocket constantly, and these are all not necessarily customer facing, you, you have a separate development program that never ends on fast innovation. So not all of these should be flown, but you want to build them anyway to, because the only learning is in the building and the actual physical testing, period. Um, so you want to build these as fast as you can, even if they don't all get used. You wish they all got used, but they don't. So you have, they don't necessarily all get used. So you have this massive growing garden of, in my case, cars, uh, and in SpaceX's case, rockets, to the point where they're trying to find interesting uses to them, like give them to schools. But they're saying, schools, can you figure out how to transport it? And these things are so big. Schools are like, yes, we would love your, your starship. And how do, we, how do we move it? So this is actually a fundamental limiting factor in agile hardware, is where do you put all the iterations? And this is one of the reasons why SpaceX, every few tests on these rockets, will intentionally perform a destructive test to determine the actual maximum pressure limits. Uh, and they clear the area and they, they have catchments for debris and they do it in a responsible way. Uh, and with the Falcon series that already is going to orbit and beyond, every so many launches, they will intentionally do an expendable launch where there's even more payload into orbit, but there's not enough fuel left to successfully recover the rocket. They could but it's simply an older version. It's now hopelessly outdated or expensively outdated and they'll soft land it into the ocean and then let it sink and let the, the environment or the eons reclaim it. So product ownership is for a product like Booster, like Launchpad, like Starship, and then also for the suppliers, the internal suppliers of them, like Barrel Section, like Tank Dome Header, like nose cone, like heat shield tile. Heat shield tile is a supplier. So you'll have something like a product owner. They don't call them product owners anymore, but something like a product owner of heat shield tile. The reason you don't have to wait on a hierarchy is because the justice board makes it so clear what the current state of the top priority metric is, your financial efficiency and you have full permission to independently iterate towards improving the scope of that problem, that situation. And then you have supporting KPIs that you propose. Someone doesn't give you a KPI and say, meet this. That's, that's not how it works, you propose. And these don't live forever. They retire as soon as they stop increasing the parent metric, which is financial efficiency, cost per kilogram into orbit. One of those experiments, one of those KPIs is minutes to design and build Raptor. That's the, the rocket, that's the common engine consumed by Starship and Booster. Starship, the number of Raptors changes dynamically. Uh, right now, I believe it's 27 engines in Starship, 27 Raptors. None of them built the same, all of them unique, unique alloys, unique bell shapes, unique software control per engine, all experiments for higher efficiency of cost and performance, longer life. Minutes to design and build a new Raptor so you get that pace of innovation is what you wanna be driving down. Um, this is supported by the factory as the product. In SpaceX, even in Neuralink, uh, and especially in Tesla, the gigafactories are the product. And their trend lines are items like time to start and work per module. Um, the factory itself is built in a repeating modular architecture. They start as tents with a dirt floor and the engineers are already building and designing rockets, cars, Neuralink devices in, in a tent that's bought from Amazon. Then the tent is later upgraded to a sprung structure, a sprung is the brand, and that's a, a tent that has at least a 10 year service life. It's, it's a highly industrialized long life tent. Um, and they, they are considered a permanent permitted structure. They're phenomenal. And they're very cheap and they can be deployed same day. You can order a sprung, sprung, sprung structure. And in many cases it can be erected in the same day. Worst case within the week. 
almost anywhere in the world. So it's an extremely flexible deployment system. Then those are iteratively replaced by cubes of solar panel, um, gray water uh, recycling and water treatment and in industry in the middle. And those cube sections are what compose the Gigafactory. Um, I don't know if I can zoom in enough that so you can see these cubes. Maybe not in these images, my apologies. Uh, they're repeating cube sections across all the Gigafactories. Leading KPIs are items like from time the land is purchased to start a production, uh, how much money is it per 1,000 kilograms of steel delivered? Um, that's then a related KPI is meters, volumetric meters of inspected weld per minute. These are supporting metrics. Tesla and SpaceX measure most projects in minutes or seconds. Um, a common story at SpaceX is what would you do if you knew an asteroid was going to hit Earth in nine days? Because their eventual goal by reducing cost per kilogram into orbit is to have a self-sustaining colony outside of Earth. In the event of a catastrophe on Earth, life and consciousness continue among the stars. So if an asteroid was going to have an extinction event like happened to the dinosaurs in nine days, what would you do today at SpaceX? And this is part of why most companies have a manager saying you have this deadline, meet this deadline. In the Musk companies, you don't need it. The mission is inspiring enough. Many people choose to work long hours happily and choose to trade their other hobbies like learning to play guitar to perform more towards the goal because the goal itself is inspiring. In Tesla's case, it's potentially reducing environmental risk or calamity. In SpaceX case, it's expanding the light of consciousness out among the stars. In Neuralink's case, it's a happy symbiotic relationship with our artificial intelligence overlords. Right? These are all things that if you believe in that mission, it's impossibly intrinsically motivating. And this is part of what has replaced what a traditional management function would be because you can now choose your own goal to that mission anytime in real time. So a very natural progression for most companies is we're on a year longer budget now, we're in waterfall now, which has some benefits. It's very relaxing, it's easier to manage. It interacts well with other slow moving budget cycles like many governments have. Some governments are extremely fast, but many are not. And if they know what you've committed to spend your money on five years in advance, and that matches an election cycle, it's much easier for candidates to endorse you and help write laws that support you at a large scale. Uh, and waterfall companies have these advantages. What they don't have as advantage is speed of innovation. To move towards that, you introduce product owners to cut these budgets into 30 day or less budgeting cycles, which we call the product backlog. And those are sprint goals. Then Agile, Pure Play Agile, does eliminate that and says we want flexible budgets, not a separate rhythm, and we don't need a product owner. Instead, we have real-time pull of money from a couple of months to a couple of weeks with a preference towards the shorter time scale. And then Agile at Tesla, what has become the product owner function at Tesla is real-time visibility of the financials, what is now I'm presenting is called the justice board per initiative. And any initiative is a project, goal, geography, product that is an experiment to improve the financial efficiency of the company towards its objective. These objectives are 1,000 year goals. And this gets exactly to the heart of the chief agile officer program that Peter Stevens has helped found. and. Um, we taught together in Zurich um, in 2020, I think was the, the first formal class. This a thousand year goal is what allows self-management and full autonomy because everyone knows for SpaceX, the goal is expanding the light of consciousness out among the stars. And the first step, the current step is lowering the cost per kilogram into low earth orbit. Thank you so much, everyone. It is my honor to collaborate with Peter Stevens and share what product ownership 
is now at SpaceX. Thank you.